Hey everyone, welcome. Yeah, we're live now. We're live, and this is very exciting. <laughs> All right, well, uh, hello everybody. Everybody who's uh, tuning in from wherever you are, from the Netherlands to South Africa, maybe even got some people from uh, Suriname or Indonesia. Everybody, welcome to this live stream. Uh, my name is Mitchell Isaias. And I'm here with a few very, very special guests who we'll, in, we'll introduce uh, in a bit. Maybe Nancy, you want to sort of introduce? And so also a very warm welcome from my side. My name is uh, Nancy Yawa. Um, I'm a freelance uh, researcher, writer, and sometimes curator. And uh, this time I curated together with Mitchell Isaias the exhibition Cape X Utrecht, which is running right now in the city, wonderful city of Utrecht. And um, because of this uh, exhibition, we thought it would be really useful uh, to um, have some really wonderful friends from um, South Africa, not just Cape Town, but different parts uh, from South Africa with us to uh, speak with us because uh, as it uh, turned out, our exhibition was quite timely um, with only very recently um, the King and Queen of the Netherlands visiting uh, and the Minister of Education uh, visiting um, South Africa, including Cape Town and um, well, getting into contact with some memory activists. And, um, and we're going to talk about that as well. Indeed, indeed. So, uh, as uh, said, and as you may have read online on our website, um, you know, this will be a conversation, a transatlantic conversation with Nancy and myself live from the Netherlands and our other special guests uh, from different parts of Southern Africa. Well, we introduce uh, shortly, then I'll uh, introduce the project that we are working on currently in the Netherlands, uh, the exhibition Cape ex Utrecht, and then we have a, a very special introduction from Diane Ferris. Speaking of which, um, we have three very special guests, and I'll start with uh, our elder. Um, Diane Ferris, very um, yeah, special writer, poet, and activist um, who's been doing this work for decades for a very long time and i feel very lucky that uh, we've been able to yeah have you in our digital midst uh, for this uh, yeah for this conversation uh, we actually have some work of diane in the exhibition that's a beautiful poem come to take you home and during the conversation uh, we will yeah uh, uh, engage more with your work and, and the work uh, that you have been doing. Um, our next speaker, which I would like to introduce for me in the middle of the screen is uh, no one other than Panache Gumatsi. And I was lucky enough to meet her twice this year, uh, one time here in Amsterdam and another time in the US. And I'm very happy to meet you again, but this time online. Uh, Panache is a writer, author of These Bones Will Rise Again and um, Sweet Medicine. She is a uh, researcher at a doctoral candidate at Harvard University's Department of African and African American Studies and History. And um, I think I attended one of the, yeah, this from, from, in my opinion, one of the best speeches that I've heard in quite a while was the Nelson Mandela lecture, which I attended uh, in February earlier this year, co-organized by ZAM, ZAM magazine uh, in Amsterdam. Happy to have you here as well. Last but not least, uh, Kelvin Gilfelen. Um, <coughs> uh, Nancy and myself were lucky enough to participate in a workshop, C Studio workshop in November, December of last year. And I was uh, asked to participate in an exchange focused on a certain site. And that site was the Castle of Good Hope. And the castle, for those who've not been there, is the oldest still standing uh, building, colonial building in the Cape. And I remember clearly when we 
walked into Andrews, we I got yeah, goosebumps seeing you know this VOC logo, the logo of the Dutch East India Company, seeing the names of one of the most boring places in the Netherlands, Leerdam, in the middle of Cape Town, and um, yeah, there's a very fascinating history, and it's even more fascinating how it's being used and transformed in the present uh, under the leadership of Kelvin, and uh, we will dig into his work as well today. So. I'll shortly uh, give give an introduction about the project which we are uh, engaged in in Amsterdam. So I'm going to share my screen and hope the technology will uh, allow me to. And then then she will share a few words as well. And we'll delve into the conversation. And for everybody uh, joining in via YouTube, you can uh, join by uh, yeah writing a message or a question in the chat. And throughout the conversation, we will try to. Uh, look to to add to answer some of the questions so let's go to this shared screen there it is <clears throat> there you go yeah love the technology so um as we said let me introduce a little bit about myself and TBA shortly for those who uh, may not know us. Um, I was born and bred here in Amsterdam, parents are from Suriname, a former Dutch colony in South America, the Caribbean. And I remember going to school, we didn't learn much about colonial history, the Cape wasn't even mentioned. So with friends, we set up an organization called the New Urban Collective, where we tried to connect black students. And we ended up in this building of the oldest association of Surinamese people in the Netherlands in 2016. I found out that they had a treasure filled with hidden history. This is what it looked like when we entered there in 2016. And yeah, when we started to help them organize it, we found that there was this treasure of hidden history with old magazines, signed books by Links and Hughes. Uh, also things from closer to home yeah, this is a pamphlet saying apartheid but it was about housing market discrimination in amsterdam uh, it's a picture of an anti-apartheid protest in the 1950s with otto haswell he was from suriname he was the only black co-founder of the communist party in the united states pamphlets about kitty Koti. Uh, kitty Koti is the surinamese uh yeah commemoration of the abolition of slavery which took place on july 1st 1863 on paper so as you can see we found fascinating material pictures uh documents and you name it however and we did not learn much about the cape as i said so over the past period that we've been delving into that and one of the major sources has been the lie of 1652 by Patrick Derrick Mellet. Um, and yeah, one of the things that sparked my interest was this workshop we did in, uh, in November, as I said. And here you can see the picture of the entrance of the Castle of Good Hope. We will delve into it later together with Kelvin, where you see the Dutch East India Company logo in the middle of Cape Town. And it's a very special year, interesting year because it's exactly 150 years ago the slavery was abolished uh, on paper. And we say on paper because on paper it was abolished 1863, but one of the conditions was that enslaved, formerly enslaved people had to work 10 years longer on the plantation uh, under so-called indentured period to get used to their freedom as the colonial master said. Um, and in, December 2022, uh, the former Prime Minister Rutte apologized for the Dutch role in slavery. In a speech, however, he mentioned Suriname, the Dutch Caribbean Islands, he mentioned Indonesia, but as I said earlier, the Cape was not even mentioned. And the King, Willem Alexander, made a speech as well on July 1st, 2023, and again, the Cape was not even mentioned so 
we thought it's imperative for us as memory activists, as researchers, as being part of uh, activists and black communities to, uh, you know, address this uh, in the Dutch context, to, to, to call upon, you know, uh, our political leaders to expand their vision, expand the perspective and uh, include the Cape and the people on the Cape, the descendants of enslaved in this transatlantic conversation. And of course, the apology was interesting, it was important, it was historic, but of course, merely not enough. Because if you acknowledge that you're um, partly responsible for this crime against humanity and the, the legacy is present, then we should also talk about what should follow uh, as a form of repair and reparations, but that has not been uh, dealt with enough yet. So we'll delve into this as well. Uh, this happened literally last week. Uh, King Willem Alexander, Queen Maxima visited the Cape and had an opportunity to set things straight, to at least recognize and acknowledge the role of the Dutch in the Cape. But fortunately, they didn't, and they were faced with um, yeah, righteously angry people uh, in the Cape. Kelvin and Diana were there, so we will hear from them how that happened and what exactly was said. So what we do as DBA, we try to make these hidden histories more visible. We try to contribute to a public debate around the legacies of colonialism and slavery. Uh, by developing exhibitions, organizing online and offline talks and events. One of the exhibitions we developed in July is the one called No Healing Without Repair, which focuses on the question, what should come after this apology? Because um, in the speech of Milo Kileto, he said, eh, we're not putting a period by a comma, eh, implying that the conversation should continue. So the central question in this project is, OK, what should come after this comma? What does repair, what does healing mean to our communities? Um, and these are just a few pictures of the exhibition. And earlier this month, October 6th, we opened another exhibition in the same line, uh, but then focused on the gap. And uh, one of the reasons we did that is because, as I said before, and not only was the gap not mentioned in the apology speech, but in general, in the public debate, in Dutch education, and we don't learn much about this part of history. It's very successfully erased and silenced. And we see this as a contribution in yeah, uh, uh, creating more historical awareness uh, around this part of Dutch colonialism and its legacy. Because we do learn about the history of apartheid, especially the fight against apartheid, but we don't learn that the Dutch were one of the main uh, 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 countries who established the foundation upon which apartheid was built. So in this exhibition, you see art, you see books, uh, uh, information, partly based on the work of Patrick Pedic Mellet. And one of the objects we found is this VOC uh, 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 yeah, box from 1753, probably used to transport goods from the Cape. On the right, you see a slave registry bill from 1860, And yeah, th these kinds of documents reflect the de de dehumanizing ways in which, you know, people were treated during slavery. Because it's literally a bill of sale used to, you know, uh, record the transaction of a human being named Sacha in the Cape of Good Hope. Um, and when we were in the Cape, I remember after the workshop, uh, together with my uh, partner, Jessica, I traveled to uh, Simonstown and uh, Cape Point, and we were just hanging out, relaxing. But as we work in Argos, we always visit secondhand shops. So we entered the secondhand shop in uh, Simonstown and to our Surprise, I would I should say, we were quite shocked. Yeah, well, two of the objects we saw there, you can see on this 
sheet, a apartheid sign uh, from the South African Railway, and on the right you see a election bill of the first uh, democratic elections from 1994. So yeah, we collect these items um, and display them, show them as a yeah, with the intent to invite people to learn more about this erased history and to engage in conversations like these that we will have tonight. So also in this exhibition and in this project, one of the central questions is, okay, what does healing mean? What does reparation mean? What does repair mean in the context of the cake? What should come after the comma? And that is one of the questions that we will uh, discuss during this online conversation. So with that being said, I would like to uh, give the word to Nancy, because Nancy has been doing a lot of work and research as well, especially in Utrecht. And the uh, floor is yours. <laughs> and I will keep it brief because uh, we really want to uh, also hear our guests, of course. Absolutely, absolutely. Africa. Um, but yes, um, Mitch and I have been working together already for um, some years and the folks from the wonderful folks from the Black Archives uh, are very familiar and dear to me. So it was kind of a no brainer to work together on this particular topic. Um, I've been working on colonial history, I would say, for 30 years now. I guess, yeah, Mitchell, you were still the toddler, but and um, um, from 2010 onwards, I started really focusing on slavery as I was working in the city of Utrecht, uh, which is the fourth uh, city in the Netherlands. Um, it's quite a white city, and it's also a city that is considered um, unblemished uh, if we talk about colonialism and especially slavery. Uh, people just don't connect Utrecht with the history of slavery or colonialism for that matter. It's really Amsterdam, it's Rotterdam, it's maybe Middleburg, um, especially uh, port cities. And so, but um, as someone who's been with others um, engaged in doing research uh, locally on the history of uh, slavery in, in the city of Utrecht and other cities, by the way, um, yeah, constantly we would actually see also traces of uh, South Africa and the Cape. And definitely also in Utrecht when I did commissioned research for the municipality of Utrecht, um, we came across some stories that uh, connected the Cape. Um, and so when Mitchell and I were in uh, South Africa last year, um, it, it, became, it became that kind of uh, uh, instantly um uh, yeah really important to to start speaking on this because we saw that the conversation in the netherlands was really growing on on the history of slavery but it was really about the transatlantic slavery really the triangle between europe western africa and the americas and so with that we were really forgetting a large part of the conversation um and so um, um in the uh, uh, exhibit cape ex utrecht we've also put in some of the research that we've locally come uh, come across uh which would include for instance uh mitchell already showed the fuc chest uh it might have been the chest of uh, hendrik schwellengrebel one of the governors of the cape colony who after his stint in uh, in in the cape landed in Utrecht like many other VOC employees would, um, basically, um, yeah, enjoying the free fruits of other people's labor. Uh, but this particular family, uh, the Schwellengrebels, also bought land in the countryside, uh, which is still called the Cape Woods or the Kaapsebosse in Dutch. And um, so it's all these bits and pieces. And even in the site where we are doing this exhibit, uh, there lived a woman uh, who was married to a VOC merchant, who was the daughter of a VOC merchant, and who brought her three enslaved servants from Batavia, uh, current day Jakarta, along the Cape to Utrecht for them then to live and work in this same space where we are now 
holding the exhibit. One of the women was called Sibylla from Batavia, which already shows you how um, um, how people were disenfranchised, but even dehumanized while their own names were taken away from them. Um, and so all these stories we have bundled together as fragments that show this interconnectedness. And the same goes for this location uh, that, that we have our um, exhibit in, which is um, AG uh, or AGHKU. It's an uh, exhibit space for the University of the Arts, yeah. our, our third collaborator, which we're very happy with. So thank you, HKU. Um, if you walk around the corner, two minutes walk, you will see a hotel uh, where Paul Kruger used to live when he landed in Europe. And so again, mind blowing idea that Paul Kruger would live there and was so celebrated by many, many Utrecht people. They actually did fundraisers. They um, uh, established a plaque for him to celebrate his work, um, champion his work. Um, he was visited while being there by Daniel Malang, who was a PhD student of theology from 1900 to 1905 in Utrecht, who later would say, I was very much formed by Utrecht. And um, he, of course, would turn into a very important prime minister and an architect for the apartheid regime in the 1940s, even introducing the term in South African Parliament. Um, so all these people, and these are just some of the uh, fragments that we found um, are connected to uh, the Cape. Um, and if Utrecht as a, as a city has these stories, we're actually sure that other cities might have these stories as well, of course. Um, and there's still a Kruger Street in Utrecht um, and uh, in many other um, cities in the Netherlands. Yeah? So we're not big on building monuments and statues all over the place, but just check our street names. And that's how we celebrate our colonial heroes. Um, so with that um, introduction, um, we want to bring it uh, to our friends from the Cape. And I think Mitchell, you said it already. We want to first give the floor to our esteemed poet, Diana Ferris, who has for us especially uh, a poem that she will uh, recite for us now. So, dear Diana Ferris, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Nancy and Mitchell. Nancy, I was so surprised to hear what you were saying now. Um, thank you to the two of you. I know this is a journey that we'll have to take to discover the Cape and Utrecht. Thank you. I wrote a poem um, called My Name is February, My Name is February. It's both in English and Afrikaans. And it's uh, February because I come from the Februarys. And you know what the Dutch did when they, they let go of our own names when we came to the Cape? And they gave us the months that we were sold in. My name is February. My name is February. My name is February. I is verkoop. My borste, privadele, my oor, my brain is nog nie mine. Soos die saai jou sê, loop ek opgekomen. Kap, word ek telkens gesink dier een ander storm. Geen Jesus wat op die water loop vir my. My naam is February. Ek soek nog die stang van die stuur, want onder water le die familie. Die ma aan paase hand, die kind aan maase rokspand. Hoe diep le hulle aan waterkant? My name is February. Opgeveil, verkoop, die hoogste bieder het geen vergoeding aangebied vir dit my rechte naam. Gesteel, gesink, onder water leed het nog, saam met die familie. Wrakstukke van die saai jou sê, ten grondige loop dier wind. 
briesende branders, wat die blitse hele toekomst besluit, die profaal, die profeet in die wal uitsmijt, my naam is Februari. Die mas bieker op die saaio sê, so was ek genoem, toe my heerse moedertaal gestel te kry, toe tonge met mekaar begin te knoop, en letters een vrije gang begin te loop, en een desperate poging en hoop, dat machte ook nie hier die identiteit moet stroop, word ek die mas bieker, net een naam, onder een ander licht gekraam, en diep gevuld met skaam. My name is February. I reshape this landscape. My hands wove the patterns of the vineyard. My feet pressed the grapes, and I was paid with the wine. I carry alcohol fetal syndrome children on my back. My name is February. I still march on the eve of December 1st. When I walk the cobblestones of the city, crying out in desperation, remember the emancipation of the slaves. My name is February. 200 years after the CIOC, I was given the vote. They said I was free. But don't you see how often I am submerged, way down, I'm the sunken, the soiled, forgotten, and yet memory will not leave me. My name is February, stranded at Third Beach, but no one comes to look for me. No one waves from the dunes, no bridges back to Mozambique. My name is February. I shall be resurrected, brought to the surface, unshackled, unchained, unashamed. My name is February. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you. Yeah, that was beautiful. That was beautiful. Thank you for sharing those beautiful words. Um, yeah, it's actually still <laughs> sinking in. Um, and I know that you also shared these words last week when uh, Willem Alexander, and that's the name of the Dutch king, and Maxima uh, visited the slave lodge. So yeah, we'll delve into how that experience was as well. Um, but I have one question um, to which we can already yeah, maybe share something about this part of history, because you mentioned the Sal, you say a few times in the poem. Can you maybe elaborate a bit on that? What, what that was? Certainly. The Sal you say was a ship that was en route from Mozambique to Brazil in, on the 27th uh, of December, de, uh, 1794, came around the Cape and it sank. There were 500 uh, people on board, 300 drowned and 200 were sold at the thing. And um, yes, I knew nothing of that until my <laughs> uncle, I was already in my 40s when he told me, that the Februarys that I come from were also called Dimas Beacons, the Mozambicans. And when I was asked to write the poem, because when they brought up the artifacts, they uh, wanted to hold a media, you know, uh, a briefing about this artifacts that were brought here. I, um, it was difficult for me to write the poem when they asked me to write the poem. I thought, how am I going to do it? I wrote the poem for Sarah Bartman. It touched hearts. I need to write something that is very strong again because this is so near to me. And so many don't know about this. And then I remembered what my uncle told me. My uncle told me about the Februarys. Mm. And I had my poem, my name. Is February. My name 
es wir bewahren. So when I speak, I speak about myself. I speak about my family. I speak about my people. This is for them. But those who committed the atrocities, it's also for them. I want to tell them in that poem that I have never healed. So much need to be done in order for me and my people to heal. And when I did it in front of the king and the queen, I was very uneasy because I, uh, I, because I knew people would be uneasy about this and the protesters outside. But I thought, what an opportunity to let them know what the results of slavery is. Oh. And um, when I performed the poem, I, 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 I didn't make eye contact with them. No, I didn't. But there were certain lines I thought I'll be looking at them, not directly, past them. It was important for me that they remember those lines. Amazing. Yeah, that makes total sense. Mitchell? Thank you. Thank you. Thank yeah. you so much. There's some people, by the way. I think we are. Uh, have we frozen a bit? No, I think we're good. Yeah. Nancy, you wanted to. You heard everything? Yeah. No, I just wanted you to. You heard everything else? Yeah, we, we heard you beautifully, uh, Diana. And there's Perfect. even some people in the chat who are thanking you for your. Um, it's been said, thank you for your impressive poem. Somebody else is saying hello, all deep poetry, and my name is February. So people are oh. weighing in. <laughs> yeah, indeed. So everybody uh, joining in, feel free to make a comment, uh, ask questions. Unfortunately, we cannot see you, but we can see uh, your words. Um, so maybe we can uh, move on to Kelvin. Uh, Kelvin, as was said in the introduction, you uh, yeah, see all of the castle of Poudron, yeah, the oldest still standing structure building in uh, the Cape. And yeah, I have to say one of the yeah places that really struck me was yeah that that place because of that. Yeah, very loaded history, which I could at least, uh, you know, still feel. And yeah, I was impressed by the way that you deal with this very, yeah, uneasy, violent history by, yeah, transforming it into, at least attempting to transform it as far as possible. It a place where people can learn to think critically about, uh, this history and its present. Uh, can you maybe say a little bit more about uh, the, the place and, and your work? Y yes, thank you so much, Mitchell, uh, Nancy, and Dr. Ferris for moving me. Every time I hear your February uh, poem, I think of uh, Basil February, one, one of the first uh, Kamesa people, so-called yes. colored people, people of color who fought uh, for the African National Court, for the ruling, uh, ruling party against uh, the apartheid in the Rhodesian uh, regime in the wanky insurrection with Krizani and others. So, so thank you for, for, for that. Uh, Nancy, Utre, I, I know you're my history with Utre because I, in my previous life, I've, I've been the head of tourism in the Western Cape. So we visited Utre every year to promote the Western Cape as a destination. But I didn't know some of these stories that you told me. Uh, for instance, uh, DF Malan was the name of Cape Town International Airport that they glibly uh, yes. named after this apartheid criminal, uh, Dr. DF Malan. And now that we're talking about the renaming of the mother Kretua, Kretua, the enslaved uh, woman in the Van Riebeek household. Van Riebeek, of course, was the first uh, governor of the Cape. Now there's all drama or Winnie Mandela, there's all drama, all y'all broke loose by the conservative new colonialists to, to hang on to Cape Town, uh, the name Cape Town, which is also not even the name 
my uh, Diana and my forefathers had another name for, 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 for Cape Town. But anyhow, I landed up at the Castle of Good Hope uh, 10 years, exactly a decade ago. And my first experience of the Castle of Good Hope before that was in uh, on 11 February um, 1990, when we released Mandela from the grand, obviously grand parade when Mandela had that speech. And the impression was not a good one because the walls of the castle was lined up by militia, by armed militia, who was waiting for the more than half a million people releasing Mandela on the grand parade opposite the castle for anything to happen. So I, I never had an, an, you know, a, 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 any vague idea that I will have an association with the, with, with the castle of Gudo because as a former freedom fighter against armed colonial conquest in apartheid, it would have against my DNA almost to be associated with such a, a painful uh, you know, uh, part of our history. But come as it may, some way or another, I landed up at the castle in 2013, in the same year that Van Riebeek landed in the castle, April, in April month of, of, of uh, um, 2013, Van Riebeek came there in April, 1652 that's the lie of 1652 that mitchell was he was referring to so yeah. so for, for one way or another as the first civilian manager of the castle and my yeah there it there it is there's the lie of 16 but i don't lie i landed in the in the castle in in april uh 2013 as the first civilian to manage the castle and my mandate was to transform it make it more inclusive because either we could say, let the roads must fall and the fees must fall and it must bomb up the castle, or we keep it as a tomb of armed colonial conquest and as a reference point to reflect on our history. Uh, as we chatted earlier, a lot of our history deals with the evils of apartheid, 1948 and beyond, but it doesn't delve about what the Khoi and the San and the enslaved people and the people who endangered labored people, what they went through. So the, so the idea was to take this difficult symbol, assemble people there, and let them reflect on that. So we do it in a multiple way. We do it through our exhibitions. We do it through music, through dance, through, through uh, poetry, through seminars, uh, even filming. As, uh, just to speak about filming, the uh, Women King, for instance, Women King, the, the latest Angela Davis blockbuster was, was shot at the castle. The remake of Roots, the movie Roots is about slavery, enslavement, was shot at the castle. Um, there's another one, the Book of Negroes was also shot at the castle. Oh, In wow. a Dutch film called The Price and Shaker, uh, The Price of Sugar was also shot at the castle. So somehow uh, the presence, the civilian presence and the, the idea of decoloniality attracted the movie industry also to shot movies that deals with this difficult part. So in a sense, the work, the little seeds that, that, that I mean, me or my team planted, amplified through those other me mechanisms, through seminars, through discussions, through, through webinars when COVID-19 hit us. So, th so, th so, so that is, is it. And a heavy focus of that was on enslavement and the history of enslavement, whether it's the music of the, of the minstrels or whether it is the, um, Tuan Guran and the enslaved people from Indonesia, uh, people from Ghana, Madagascar. So we focused on those stories because we realized, like all of you realize, that the curriculum, whether university curriculum, school curriculum, primary school curriculum, the curriculum of the heart ignored this part of our history. It, it, it's not there. So, yeah. so, so in a sense, my, um, my, 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 all my redemption in my mind as a former uh, so as a former political activist is that I could make that contribution in the public uh, domain, in the public history to unearth some of these stories and that people take control of the stories and that, that, that me, the, the calling of me there had that meaning because it was simply to be a catalyst to unearth these stories because you had a government that was preoccupied with development issues and the issues of the heart, the issues of transformation, of reconciliation, of nation building, of healing, of memory, of keeping those memories were, in a, in a, I wouldn't say neglected, but it was not, you know, on the, on, on the, on the, front, on the front of the top of mind of people.
And it was not easy. It was difficult. There was a lot of resistance because the Cape is in, in, in essence, spatially speaking, politically speaking, demographically speaking, still a apartheid colonial city like Gaza or Paris, where you have certain bodies are not uh, are not comfortable in certain spaces. And 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 although apartheid and the books has been scrapped, what is it now, almost 30 years ago, the the psychological impact of the DF Malans and the Fervurts and the Krugers and the colonial masters before that lives in other forms. It's it's not only systemic or structural, it's it's almost it's psychological that that if a white couple comes down the street and one of the lower class black people would be the same on the same side, they will almost automatically give way for that white couple. And and, and that's the the deep, deep damage of, of, of armed colonial conquests of and you throw in the Bible, you throw in the role of the missionaries, how, how that whole mixture of of, colon, of, of coloniality, is, if I can summarize it, imperialism has in fact um, went in auto gear. You know, when the car is in auto gear, you autopilot, in autopilot, and we we deal with the legacies of 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 of, of that today. So it's a it's a it's a for me as a as a former activist, we can't have a civil, a beautiful conversation of somebody so something so brutal and something still so alive in the present and then you want you want a decent conversation with the queen and the king about these things so what you saw on the clips on, on you know international media is exactly how the memory community that i'm dealing with is feeling about uh restitution about about uh what do we call it um, apologies whether it's genuine apologies or whether it is uh symbolic apologies uh th th there's a feeling that there is a need for a an engagement where the former colonized and the former colonizers sit as equals around the table to discuss about these issues and not as receivers of crumbs whether it is in in, in terms of grants and loans and, yeah, and yeah. aid and whatever but 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 really conscious and fortunately for me as an activist the way that the world is developing the new geopolitical reorganization of the world is creating that platform for this conversation to be not only theoretical, but to jump into real action. I hope that's that's. Uh, but yeah, I'm no, you already touched upon a few uh, issues from the legacy of Dutch slavery to you know the question of repair, and uh, yeah, well, we still have some time to dig into that. Um, but before uh, we, we we delve into that, I wanted to give the word to Panache as well. Um, uh, as said in the introduction, doctoral candidate at Harvard and recently gave the Nelson Mandela lecture. And uh, you, you you mentioned just now that uh, growing up, you didn't learn anything about the issue of slavery, even though you belong to the post 1994 generation. Um, but in your lecture, you did, you know, speak uh, beautifully, as far as you can speak about it beautifully. And you showed uh share the very interesting analysis of uh you know the slavery the voc uh the koi voc wars so can you maybe tell a little bit about how you studied it even though you didn't uh, learn about it in school right first of all thank you so much i'm honored to be here um on this platform sharing um the space with you um in particular i mean first mitchell you and i met a couple of years ago because many of us when we think about the netherlands yes it's in our background somewhere that the netherlands maybe that's the place where um you know you can get some weed you can go to the red light district you know they supported the anti-apartheid struggle but wherever i go i'm always interested in finding out where the black people what is the black history? And that's when I reached out to you and I got to learn a lot more about uh, black Dutch history, Afro Dutch history. And we began having these conversations. I think it's about five years since we've been having these specific conversations. 
And uh, of course, as a historian, that's always really important to think through these transatlantic connections, um, that these things never happen in isolation. When we think about 1652, we think about it within the broader transatlantic slave trade that fundamentally transforms the whole Black world, and not just the Black world, the whole world, because very often what uh, the enterprise of history does, history proper, is that uh, our histories are meant to be provincial histories. They're not the histories that remake and reshape the world. And if we know fundamentally transatlantic slavery transforms the world metaphysically, materially, there's a reason why um, Adam Smith, when he speaks about the crossing or the rounding of the Cape of Good Hope um, all the way back in 14, uh, or 1498, that fundamentally is one of the most important events in world history that opens up, but particularly it opens up a particular way of doing business, opening up global capitalism. And what fundamentally changes things is the trade in people. Yes, we've had slavery before, but the idea that people, and in particular African people, can become property is what fundamentally transforms the world. And so when I was asked to do this Nelson Mandela lecture, um, again, I always think that it's it's always, always very convenient to bring in uh, the natives of another land to come and speak to uh, the problems over there and not the problems within the country. Um, and it was important, and particularly because of the ways in which Nan Mandela's memory is abused across the world as a way to speak of reconciliation without these questions of, of, of repair, without those very difficult questions. So for me, coming into to, to Amsterdam, coming in and thinking about what's happening with the black community there, what's happening with the Afro-Dutch community, and knowing that there had been that so-called apology, I don't consider it an apology, it's a sorry apology by the Dutch prime minister uh, that had taken place in December 2022, and understanding that there had been the uh, huge backlash within the Afro-Dutch community, it was an opportunity for me to then make those connections between the impacts and the legacy of transatlantic slavery, and particularly Dutch slavery in South Africa, and linking it to Afro-Dutch on the really the broader Black world struggle. Um, there are countries within the world that really sometimes get away with, um, you know, these, uh, when we're talking about the legacy of slavery, people think, oh, it's an American issue, uh, maybe it's a British issue. Someone in the chat was talking about Portugal. Portugal really is the initiator of this transatlantic slave trade, but somehow they've been erased um, from, from this conversation. And it's time for us mm. to be having these conversations. And so for me, as someone who grew up in post-apartheid South Africa with the legacy of things like the truth and reconciliation, which again thinks about truth and reconciliation beginning in 1960 to 1994. So there's at least three centuries of foundational terror that are not part of the conversation around uh, racial reconciliation, which is why people today say there has been no such thing as truth and reconciliation in the country because we have yet to be even begin to think about slavery. And what is quite important around thinking about how slavery fundamentally shapes South African society is the fact that when the first slave ship arrives in 1658, the Amersfoort arrives with 147 Angolan children, they outnumber the settlers. And so from the very beginning, South Africa begins as a slave society, not just a society with slaves, as a slave society. And as you continue with the thousands of people who were brought in from all over the Indian Ocean Basin, um, you then get to the systems of in Bukestal, for example, um, with the so-called commando systems going right up into the interior, bringing in um, uh, Africans as, as enslaved people. Every single major conflict between the Boers and the Britons throughout South African history, all the way going up to uh, you know, the South African War or the Anglo-Boer War, was over the question of slavery. When uh, the, the, the British take over the, the Cape in the late 19th century, or rather the late 17th, 18th century, part of the excuse is that we are going to bring uh, a freedom and emancipation, and of course we know that's a lie, to the Cape. And we know part of those efforts around abolition are really about the ability to have black people or enslaved people now allowing us to have access to the labor through their market. It's not for humanitarian purposes. When you then have the so-called great trick um, that Afrikaners really, uh, you know, the transformation from Boers into 
Afrikaners, the great trick really is about the question of slavery because they are protesting the question of emancipation at the Cape. And when they move in, we then see when uh, the British then annex Natal from, and take it over from the, 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 uh, from, the, uh, from the Boers, it's specifically one of the excuses that they use is because of Boer slavery of Africans within the interior. So therefore we have to take over Natal from these Boers. So throughout, I mean, you even then go to the, the, the South African war, um, part of the argument is over the question of minerals and the natives who are going to go in and mine. So when you think about the South African mining industry, for example, the specific model that they use for mining in South Africa was built and was copied from by one a Welsh engineer who was called Thomas Kitto. He took that from Brazilian slave mining. So when you have to understand all of these things, that slavery really fundamentally shapes all of the kinds of relations, the Master and Servants Act, when you think about questions of segregation, they all come out of slavery. You cannot understand South Africa if you do not understand slavery. You cannot, for example, understand the fact that today you continue to have one of the world's highest fetal alcohol syndrome um, rates in the Cape it's and in the world, really, fetal alcohol syndrome uh, in the world is because of the DOP system. These are the descendants of enslaved people. So whenever people talk to me about Cape Town and they love Cape Town, I would say Cape Town is really a city that has taught me to distrust beauty. I always wonder what is the violence that has underwritten the beauty uh, that people are thinking about. When you go to a city like Cape Town, you understand fundamentally that this is a slave port and we continue as as Calvin was saying, in the demographics, in the infrastructure, everything about Cape Town is seeping through it. But what is important to understand is that the legacy of enslavement doesn't stay just with Cape Town. It goes throughout and shaping the history of this country. It's no mistake that all of these extremities have come through, through, through South Africa. So we really see Cape Town as the ground zero of a terrible system of master and servants, beginning with master and slave relationships at the Cape. And, and finally, what I would just say is I thought it was really important, Calvin, when you said that you were the first civilian uh, uh, who was the head of, uh, of the Cape Lodge. And I think it's important because when recently Mitchell and I were, were in, um, at Howard University, we're talking about uh, global black solidarity and struggles. And one of the students said something really important is what if we stop thinking of people as merely enslaved, but understanding that these were prisoners of war. And if we understand the wars that the Khoi fought against the VOC or the Dutch East India Company, we understand all of the wars of conquest and the resistance that we had. That was against the conquest that the Dutch East India Company begins with 1652. And we understand that the wars of enslavement and conquest are really a continuum that have shaped how the relations in this country continue uh, to function. So I really thank my, my fellow panelists. Thank you to Mitchell and to Nancy for bringing this conversation um, because it, it really is important to think how every single aspect of the society continues to be shaped by enslavement. And so when we think, and we'll talk about this more um, when we continue the conversation, when we think about these questions of, in, uh, of reparations, it means the end of the world as we know it. There's not, it's not simply a check that can be given to us <clears throat> continue, you have to restructure everything metaphysically and materially if we're only going to, if we ever have a chance of ever addressing the issues that have been brought upon us by this issue of transatlantic slavery. Wow. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for this uh, yeah, almost like uh, mini lecture. Mini lecture. That was exactly the word that I was uh, trying to do. Can I, can I just add one more thing? Just to say, specifically, if we think about slave memory, again, I grew up in post-apartheid South Africa, and one of the many, the first times maybe I might have began to think about this question of slavery, and maybe I didn't have the words, was through Diana Ferris's work um, in making sure the memory of Sargi Bartman was part of our post-apartheid memory. I do still remember, even if I didn't have the understanding, when Sargi Bartman was brought back and we saw it on the SABC and we saw you recite your poem. So this is the kind of work that's important that allows us in the next generation to continue to remember and to fight for, for our ancestors. So thank you so much to you, Diana, for that work. Thank you, Panache. Thank you.
Well, and this is exactly why that poem is in the exhibit, because it was written in Utrecht um, in 1998 during your stint at the Gender Studies program, right, Diana? Yeah, yes. Yeah. So this might be a nice moment also to just give a shout out to the seven artists, uh, among them Diana, who are actually part of uh, the Cape Ex Utrecht uh, ex exhibition. Just want to mention their names and their work uh, very briefly. So, of course, Diana Ferris with her poem, um, I've Come to Take You Home, including uh, the video. Um, we have another po poet called, um, or spoken word artist rather, Jasper Albinus, who has actually um, given voice to one of the enslaved servants who lived in that building where we are holding the exhibit, um, mm -hmm. from Batavia. He's given her uh, a voice also through his work, which uh, we love. Uh, Neo Moyanga. Um, a very familiar name for, for our South Africans. And uh, I loved your yeah. earlier remark about uh, distrusting beauty. This is actually uh, that, something that we discussed, uh, Neo and, and I. Um, uh, he um, is a composer, musician, and installation artist. And he uh, his work yeah. uh, is a show, um, uh, A Maze in Grace, where he plays with that whole notion of the song and who it wrote and the whole sort of context around it. Judith Westerfeld, who was born in the Netherlands, was, who's lived in South Africa um, for part of her time um, and who makes audiovisual uh, installations, performance-based work and photo collages. And she's uh, done work um, called The Remnant, which uh, talks about the, the hedge of uh, Jan van Riebeek, which he installed in, um, yeah, immediately installing inclusion, uh, colonial inclusion and exclusion. Um, Shishani Franks, um, who is a vocalist, guitarist, songwriter, com composer, who brought the Namibian story to us uh, in her work, Namibian Tales. Um, super important because in the within the layer of ignorance about South Africa, there's a deeper ignorance even how Namibia is implicated in this whole apartheid uh, history and yeah. colonial history at large, of course. Uh, Farron van Dijk, who um, is, I think, together with Jasper, um, born in the 90s, post-apartheid. Uh, she's South African and Dutch. Um, she's actually an alumnus from the University of the Arts in Utrecht. Um, and um, has done her work around the, the post-apartheid post, post generation um, uh, with, uh, in her photography work. And last, but certainly not least, and um, Mitchell and I are very much indebted to her as a very important advisor, um, co-text writer for the exhibit, but also one of the seven artists, which is Karine Zaimam who hails from Cape Town, now lives in Utrecht uh, wow. since 2019, um, and who is an artist, a scholar committed to engagement, critical engagement with colonial archives and collections, and who is actually a descendant of Krutoa. Wow. <laughs> so those are our artists. Mitchell, back to you. Thank you. Thank yeah, you to yeah. the artists. I think some of them are actually uh, online as well. So indeed, shout out to them. Um, and yeah, already uh, blown away by all of the contributions. I think Panache touched upon something very important how, you know, you cannot understand South Africa about that, fight against it and its legacy without understanding slavery. I think the same goes for. Uh, the Netherlands and other former colonies from Suriname to the Dutch Caribbean islands. Um, and so that's why it's so important that we continue to have these conversations also, and also understand how, you know, these systems connect because, um, you know, so fundamental for a lot of the issues that we uh, still face in uh, uh, present day societies. So, <clears throat> um, I was, I think it's interesting to look at these legacies. You already touched upon it, uh, you know, in different ways. And yeah, one of the 
legacies that we yeah, still see until today is the, the, the exoticization, you know, ideas of race, which intersects with gender, sexuality, uh, which still continues to divide people, still continues to, um, you know, lay a foundation for the dehumanization of people in uh yeah you know across the world and one of the poems uh, works that are included in the exhibitions of come to take you home uh, which was written by diane when she was uh, working living in Utrecht. sorry yeah living in Utrecht. Uh, i was wondering if you can yeah say a little bit more about how you know that came about and and the impact that it has had uh, throughout the years Um, yes, I was doing a, a, a course, uh, I was there for six weeks, I was doing a course on sexuality in the colonies, uh, on the eros and pathos, and um, well, uh, we learned about Saki again, and uh, I was slowly but surely getting homesick. Uh, because remember, it was a different landscape, it's different people, and um, I was longing for my country with its landscape, with its people, with its soil. I was also longing for my mother who died the previous year, and to then to learn about Sarki or Sara. Um, and then just reliving in a way of you know, imagining, you know, what she had gone through, just really got to me. One evening, when I stood in my room and looked out of the window, with the stars so far away, and um, I said to myself, if I was in my country, I'd be able to touch those stars. And then it was as if there was a voice calling out. I want to go home. I want to go home. Uh, and there was an interview held with Sarki um, where she said she only wants to go home to the Hantus Valley where she came, where she came from. And this all made me so sad. I thought it was Sarki calling out she wants to go home. And with tears streaming down my cheeks, I went to my desk and I wrote there the first line, I've come to take you home, never knowing how prophetic that was going to be. That night I finished the poem, I just added another line to it uh, where I say, for well, you have brought me peace. And um, yeah, I was, I, I didn't write it for any intention just to, you know, to, to lift myself out of the sadness, this very sadness mm. I was feeling for myself mm. and for her and the longing for my mother. I thought, yeah, if I miss my mother this much, how much more did she? And um, I read the poem in the class, uh, which touched many people, especially my lect lecturer, um, Rosalind Bakerman. I came home read it and then found that there is power in this poem because people were moved by it people cried when i did it and it's so much they they requested it every time when i was at a um a, at a function at a party and i said to myself these these requests and the feelings that being touched by the people allowed those words to fly to france uh, one of our great um, artists, Willy Bester, he made a, a sculpture of her, and it was on. It went onto the internet, and it's where, there where a French senator saw the poem. He was busy preparing a bill because a law had to be made for the artifact. Sarah was seen as an artifact 
and all artifacts in French museums belong to the French state. So if you want to do anything with it, you have to make a law. So Senator Abu was busy preparing a bill. Um, and then he saw the poem and he, and, he, and he wrote to me to ask me if he can translate the poem into French so that he could use it as part of his bill. And then he introduced the bill on the 29th of January, 2002. He read the poem in the Senate and it must have touched the hearts of the French uh, senators. Nobody voted against it. And uh, that was on the 29th of January, 2002. And on the 29th of April, 2002. 27th, we left South Africa on our Freedom Day for France. And on the 29th of April, she was handed over to us. It was an emotional journey. I, when I go to schools, I tell the children I cried buckets full of tears. And um, the French Minister of Research said, we must ask ourselves who the real monster in this story is. Because Napoleon's great, great scientist, George Cuvier, refers to her actually as a monster. When they dissected her body, took out her brain, genitalia, he wrote books full of how everything of hers, her brain, private parts, her hair, her breast and nipples, showed that she's not really human, that she is what Darwin would call the missing link between human and ape. And I say that those writings followed us. It was in their novels, it was in their poetry, it was in their papers that they wrote. Yeah. And it followed us. Same as slavery. And that's why she becomes very important. She becomes an important memory uh, because there were many after her that went and went through the same thing, but only her name was recorded. So, um, yeah, she came, um, we came home with her uh, in the plane and the pilot didn't announce that she was in the plane. But when the next morning when we entered South Africa's airspace, he announced, yeah. we welcome Sarah Bartman, sure. back into a country of birth wow. for 192 years. I could never yeah. say that without crying. Wow. What a victory over colonialism yeah. and its brutality. And she was buried in the valley where she came from, the Hamtuas Valley, her one wish being fulfilled. Wow. Thank you so much, Diana. This is deeply, deeply moving. And um, I'm going to make sure that Rosemary Baikuma will hear this. <laughs> because um, um, you, you know Thank that Rosemary Baikuma um, um, said goodbye as a, as a professor and um, head of the Women's Studies, Gender Studies Department uh, this month. Yes. And I, yes. Um, yes. I actually played your poem uh, in, in a video during that uh, day that she said goodbye. And um, she was deeply, deeply moved and had to cry again. Um, as we all are crying when we engage with your poem. And, um, um, you know, there's many um, South Africans uh, who come in into our exhibit space and start crying and especially when they see your poem oh, wow. also because they feel at home uh, seeing all the works seeing uh, you know the space basically um and yeah. and so connecting with the stuff that you're saying about being so homesick and missing the country so yeah the, everything around it and about it um so 
yeah, thank you so much. That that's deeply touching, deeply moving. Um, um, we and people keep talking in the uh, chat. Thank you for that. Keep coming with your remarks and your questions. Um, and somebody is also saying, so glad that um, Saichi is home. Indeed, we are. Um, um, maybe it's time now also to move to this uh, to today's world and the notion of reparations, because in a way the reinterment of of Saichi Bagman uh, can be can be read as a as an expression of reparations and repair and um, and healing. But um, I think uh, now that the Dutch people that, that the Dutch people are starting to realize that there are some holes. Um, in our common knowledge about uh, the history of slavery and colonialism, what is it that we need to do or should do? And this is something that, of course, Mitchell and I cannot answer, but uh, really should be you know, asked to you, um, Calvin, Diana, and Panache. So um, maybe we can use uh, some of this remaining, remaining time to talk about that. Um, and whoever wants to, and I see um, Calvin <laughs> skipping for a bit. That we have, of course, sometimes some trouble with um, with uh, sh load shedding, as uh, as we now know in <laughs> South Africa. Mm -hmm. This is a, this is a yeah. daily practice, and we have to work around it. But um, um, uh, yeah, so Calvin, oh, so okay. maybe. I hope you will join in a, in a minute again, because uh, yeah. you asked me to this, share this is an interesting um, uh, remark, actually. I was initially furious that the castle exhibits a Dutch history, says someone. But after tonight, I realize how important that actually is. <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's a fair point. Mm -hmm. But I have to say, uh, we've met um, young activists in Cape Town who don't like to go there, right? Because it's 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 an awful space, of course, that reminds them of colonial violence in its most material form. But I guess for for Dutch people going there, I, I, like Mitchell said, I was also shocked to see the six logos of the VUC um, cities, including my um, birth town, Delft. Um, Mitchell was from Amsterdam, but there's also the Delft logo there, and it's like it's crazy to realize that. That logo is Del there, but there's also a city called Utrecht and a city called Delft, or town rather, in um, South Africa. There's all this interconnectedness, right? But let's move back to the notion of reparations. Um, uh, both Diana, Panasha, maybe you can start, Panasha. Uh, what do, what are your thoughts on on reparations and 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 the connection with the Dutch? I just wanted to say uh, thank you to Panache for that wonderful, wonderful uh, presentation. Um, as a, I said, born free, <laughs> you really did your work. <laughs> thank you, Panache. Um, yeah, uh, I'll go, uh, uh, Nancy. You know, I was uh, when the apology came. Uh, I was interviewed by one of the Dutch journalists, and we went to the castle and just, you know, went, went through that torture chamber. And um, it was for me as if I see the faces there. And I had to touch the walls to say, it's okay, it's okay, we're working on it. And um, I said in the interview that the king must come here. He must see what the results are. How hundreds of years still didn't bring any healing. He must come here, he must come see for himself, and he must ask forgiveness mm. himself to us. And he must ask us what he can do what he can do to help. And I said, there's such a lot to be done. Our young people 
I mean, it's, it's they just going, a lot of them are just going, you know, down the ground because it seems as if the, 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 the effects of slavery is getting worse. The name slavery isn't there anymore, but slavery is present, present mm. in all its forms. So reparations, yes, yes, yes. Let us talk, okay? I'm not only going to protest, but we'll have to talk. Beautiful. And um, <clears throat> when I say you yeah, gave this uh, amazing lecture in February, and also just now you, you shared your thoughts in which you reiterated um, your point of view that, you know, the apology was a sorry one. And yeah, real reparations means the end of, you know, the world as we know it and because slavery was so fundamental for this capitalist racial racially loaded capitalist world that we still live in um yeah can okay, you maybe elaborate a little bit uh, about it and i see that Kelvin is back and joining and adding him to the stream again but, nice uh, welcome, welcome back, back. Welcome back. <laughs> thank you panache please Oh, la la. Oh, there we go. Sorry. You know, yeah. just as we're coming in, that's the spirit of Rhodes deciding that you're not going to speak. <laughs> exactly. My ancestors have a stronger spirit, so we're going <laughs> to have, <laughs> have this. Yeah, I think, you know, the title of, of, of my lecture was Nitoli Sangani, meaning with what are you apologizing? And specifically, um, I just want to go back to the fact that South Africa is used as a particular model for re racial reconciliation with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Um, and the first line of, of, of my lecture was to say that you do not say sorry with your mouth. <laughs> That's an interesting moment to have. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Again, a freeze. <laughs> Perfect moment to freeze. Oh, yeah. yes. Those spirits, because now we're getting to it. Now they're deciding yeah, 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 to, yeah, fight, yeah. To, fight, to fight me, but it's fine. If it doesn't work again, I'm going to then um, use my cell phone. But really, it was to say that we have... Yeah, the spirits are definitely fighting. The spirits oh, are fighting. On, I will try one on. more time. Okay. <laughs> is to say that we have a historical consciousness and part of what slavery did is not just material it's metaphysical right i mentioned the fact that when descartes says i think therefore i am this is in the year this is the foundation of so-called modern western philosophy this is in the year that the go on go on you're back and the point being that we are dispossessed of our own systems of reparations and reconciliation. These systems are really important. One thing when people talk about Ubuntu as the basis for amnesty, uh, for the true reconciliation, is to remember that's a Christianized Ubuntu that says you forgive 77 times. Uh, in our own African jurisprudence, for example, there's a saying that people don't like, well, a dictum that people do not like to remember, which is, meaning, it does not happen that the calf of the hippo You're back. I'm back. Okay. I don't know if you heard that, but I specifically say the dictum that says it does not happen that the calf of the hippo is eaten by the crocodile and the pool remains still. Mm. That is a direct refutation of this idea of amnesty as a form of accountability when we're talking about reparation. Ubuntu, as it is actually practiced 
amongst us requires that there must be a material enfleshment of the spirit of reconciliation and reparation. And so when we think about these things within the context of the world, we have to understand and we cannot allow ourselves to be bought off by checks. We know that the judge gave us 200 million for uh, memorials and whatever silliness. It was quite an insult, really, thinking about the, the Dutch GDP, thinking about how much the Dutch slave trade in golden age made, and then to offer all of the descendants of enslaved people across the Dutch Atlantic 200 million is nothing short of an insult. But importantly, what we should know is that to be given a check to be given you know something which you know it doesn't fundamentally change the structure of the world that we spirit of rose is strong today <laughs> It becomes, it becomes important that we think globally about these questions. There's a reason why when, for example, IET, um, when the president spoke of reparations in the 2000s, they then become, there's a coup against him. Mm -hmm. There's a coup against him. When David Cameron goes to Jamaica, we have to think about this in global perspective. It cannot be a national fight because transatlantic slavery was not merely a, a national enterprise because the reason why they ensure uh, that in one part of the world, if this happens here, we have to stop it because it's going to have reparations or we have to, repercussions for the rest of the world. They understand more than we do that if you were to begin to give reparations to fully account, they would not be in existence. They know this. I think more than we know ourselves. If we think it's a, it, our, and I always say this, that our ancestors did not die for a seat at the table. Mm. There's so much more that we can think of and go beyond simply being included. I mean, inclusion, for example, to give you a concrete example, inclusion is happening right now when you see at the UN, a descendant of enslaved people is calling for uh, or, or, or blocks a ceasefire against Palestine, for example. We see the Colin Powers of the world, the Condoleezza Rises of the world. That's what a seat at the table and representation politics look like. You're going to be included into empire. We don't want that. We want a fundamental reorganization of the world order. Just to bring it into, into perspective of the things that are happening right now, when we ask why should black people care about things like Palestine, for example, what we should understand is this is a rule-based or so-called rule-based international order that was created during transatlantic slavery. When we talk about things like right of conquest, conquest probably. Conquest. <laughs> yeah. We are with you. We are with you. <laughs> You're so back. we will have to think about perhaps yes, the macro things that we will require at the community level, at national level. But just like what CARICOM has done, for example, is to begin to think of it regionally, we as well, and I think one of the best steps that we have already is the fact that we're having this transatlantic conversation. We have to be able to band together because this did not start within the nation state. It was a global enterprise. And unless us as Black peoples, um, the descendants of enslaved people, the descendants of the colonized come together, we're going to keep on being put into the nation state and we're going to, which anyway we're excluded from, but we're going to keep on fighting for these little borders that ultimately do not serve us. So I think the key thing then is, I mean, I, I appreciate what CARICOM has done, for example, but I will say part of my disappointment with that 10 point plan is that it's a very much a developmentalist um, kind of uh, a, a, a way of thinking about this issue of, 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 of reparations. It is, you know, giving aid, development aid and those kind of things, but we know that those things don't change the structure. We know that in Europe, there's more that comes out of Africa than flows into Africa through development aid, for example. So that's not going to be, it's going to be a fundamental restructuring of the world. Um, and it requires us to reimagine, to be brave enough to rethink, and part of it, especially those of us who are imperial cores, um, you know, we're in, whether it's in the Netherlands, whether it's in South Africa, we have to think, what are we prepared to lose 
in order to have our, our freedom. Um, because the ways in which many of our countries are structured, the kind of wealth that, for example, United States has, the kind of wealth that the Netherlands has, would have to necessarily be given up in order for reparations to truly uh, make an impact. So I think that's really important for us before we even go out <laughs> to the, our former colonizers is to really think about how do we come together and to think about what are we willing to give up for our liberation? Because it's not going to be, uh, 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 as we've seen with Palestine, for example, it's it's not going to be a, a walk in the park. These systems are built on violence. And we're seeing that right now, that violence that took that Thank you, Banash. Um, beautifully spoken and uh, yeah, taking the, the global context uh, into uh, um, um, into view. Um, and then maybe it would be nice for Calvin to, uh, as someone who is um, uh, watching over the oldest um, material, ex yeah, um, uh, example of that colonial violence. Um, um, how would you speak about uh, what would what would what would, would sorry what would your thoughts be in terms of um, the role um, of reparations from your point of view and maybe also from the from you know from the point of view of you um, having this castle um, uh, as a way to remember. Thanks, uh, Panas. Thanks for the uh, passionate um, perspective. The, uh, uh, I miss, we missed a lot, but I, I think I get the crux of the matter. So if we see the castle or, or castles around the world as the remnants, as the material remnants of armed colonial conquest, of as symbols of brutalization, of dehumanization, of the, the, the worst atrocities. I, I'm not sure. Nazis. Seems a little, be a little bit of the of a echo when you speak. Declared a crime against humanity, a party that's been declared a, a crime against humanity. I'm not sure if slavery has been uh you know been been uh officially is it better oh that's yeah uh, i think uh there's something wrong with this connection unfortunately yeah um so we still we said we would um go on till 8 30 but we uh since everyone's so passionate about uh, this topic and people are learning a lot uh, while listening in through you through well all kinds of spaces. Uh, I just want to reiterate, you can ask questions uh, through the chat or post your remarks. So we also want to give listen, uh, yeah, people listening in uh, a chance to um, to uh, weigh in. Um, and through Instagram and the chat, we can already see that people are, uh, are really, um, yeah, being taught here uh, by excellent speakers. Um, and there's one suggestion actually in the chat um, would it be an idea that the speakers from South Africa write an open letter to be published and shared widely in the Netherlands? Their comments are very important. Um, well, that is to say, if you t have the time and the energy for that, because there's so much to do. Uh, but I think, yeah, this there is a window of opportunity now for people also being very open to input from South Africa, because one of the basic questions, so uh, Mitchell and I both have been interviewed several times during uh, the opening, both by local, but also national press. And all the journalists ask the same question. Do people actually, is there uh, um, a memory community in, the, in, in South Africa on this issue? And <laughs> we have to basically explain them. Yes, there is, there's a memory community, there's memory activism. Um, and there's a memory culture, both materially and uh, through immaterial culture and heritage. Um, so 
you know, it's that basic. So go on, Diana, please. Uh, I just, you're talking about a memory culture. Yes, there is, uh, especially uh, on the 30th of November uh, each year. Uh, we gather at uh, church square, it's close to where the tree was under which slaves were sold. Um, then we, we uh, actually, no, we don't gather there. We, we gather at the quarry where the slaves toiled, um, you know, to build the city of Cape Town, to get the rock out mm -hmm. and all those things, to build the streets. And, and, and then we march uh, with our bands and our people at about 10 o'clock at night. Uh, we march through the city and uh, the Boerkaap to the church square where that tree is. And then we have mm -hmm. a program there. Yeah. So that's part of the exactly. memory culture. Yeah, yeah, and, and Mitchell and I were were <coughs> very fortunate to to be present um, at thir November third, twenty twenty two. So it was very beautiful to uh, to oh. be part of that. Okay. Um, yeah, and um, I um, there's of course also the Cape Malay songs every year. Um, there is the uh, memory uh, and also in September 24, yes. right? Yeah. There's the Heritage Day, so there's several moments. Yeah, there's heritage. Yeah, yeah, and also if you, if you look at the Afrikaans language, mm -hmm. it, it, it's now much more open that the language came about uh, through the slaves and through the indigenous people, but Dutch as a background, but over, you know, when, uh, what is his name? The uh, Genootskap van the Right Afrikaners, the Association of the Right Afrikaners. They then took the language, Africa, and they made it, they standardized it, as they said, and they made <laughs> So I ask, uh, like pa Patrick, uh, 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 Malay asked uh, if they then were the right Afrikaners, who were the wrong Afrikaners? Exactly. Because the people at the Cape called themselves the Afrikaners. That's now yeah. the, 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 the descendants of the slaves and the, and the indigenous people. And, and they then became the Afrikaners. Yeah. Yeah. Which is wrong, because if you're from Africa, you're an Afrikaner. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> I think having these conversations are very important because when uh, we talk about reparations, uh, um, before we can even get to the stage of you know thinking critically about what that means, about imagining you know. A different world outside of the confines of this global capitalist system built on three to four hundred years of slavery and colonialism. Um, restoring this memory is so important yeah? because what we see in general, and especially what we've seen over the past two weeks, you know, with the uh, yeah, disastrous uh, situation in Palestine, is that if people remain thinking within the confines of you know uh, eurocentric uh, thinking mainstream knowledge you know we even when we try to um uh, 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 change certain things we remain within the confines of global capitalism okay? instead of fighting for fundamental change people fight for a seat at the table which merely means that you know, we reproduce the same symptoms, but then with a bit of diversity splashed on top of it. Uh, I see that uh, Kelvin is back. Uh, hopefully the connection mm. is uh, yeah. restored and repaired. I don't know where I was cut off, but I was echoing what Panasia was saying about yeah. that we need to um, destroy the, the, the structures of post-World War II because they were all Built to maintain colonial 
and uh, neo apartheid uh, structures and processes. So the World Bank, the IMF, the United Nations, UNESCO, so all of those structures needs to they need to be broken down if we want to build a new order. If we want to have decent conversations, because right now we can't have decent equal conversations around that. Just in summary, what what I was said about was cut off. Then in terms of memory communities, I was fortunate in those ten years to have memory communities, physical ones and online ones. So we also I've heard Diana talking about the the slave walk, the thirty November first of running into first of December, but we also have a cultural memory group around enslavement. Uh, they are recreating the second of New Year route, the minstrel route, where they, you know, the street minstrel. Oh, okay. So we are we are busy. Yeah. We are busy with the process to get it nominated or yeah, nominated as a national heritage route. Like we have Soweto, you know, the Soweto uprising of, of 76 yeah. is the Soweto route where the student students march against Afrikaans, not all against Afrikaans and apartheid my mother tongue and so is there a route that's been mapped out uh in the cape but the issue i'm not sure if i missed this that that is fundamental to this is the issue of the relationship between the enslaved people in the cape and elsewhere and the indigenous people because mm. what the dutch and the colonialists has done and what they are still doing is to divide and rule so even when we when we uh, organized the protest against the King Willem Alexander and uh, and 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 the, and the, and the Queen, Oxymo. there was these divisions between. But why why are the people with the straight hair, the people of slave descent, why are they important? Why are you speaking to them? And we were the people who faced the brunt of colon colonial conquest. We were disarmed our water ways were cut off our the almond the almond tree that van ribic planted the wild almond was and form a very early form of apartheid and as panache rightly said uh, nobody wants to take responsibility for apartheid but the dutch and the british and the portuguese and all the colonial masters had forms of apartheid they might have called it apartheid as during our time and as they call it in palestina now but 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 there were always forms of racial segregation because the whole colonial arm um, colonial systems of enslavement is built on hierarchy our mother uh, our mother sarki bartman was was by this hero napoleon called uh, a less human being the missing yeah. link between man and ape and and, and that and, and and so those relations with the indigenous people uh were then you know almost transplanted onto the enslaved people and we're living with those legacies today yeah so so a, a palestinian child killed uh or, or maybe under what what is the equation 100 palestinian uh, uh women and children or one uh israeli settler you know they, we, it, it, we we're starting or the western world plays with human lives as 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 hierarchical as hierarchical and so panacea is right panacea is right we we cannot we cannot with the current structures of reparations and of restitution and of a few stolen arts here in benin give handing handing over while millions are still sitting in the british museum we 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 we, we cannot go with that divided we cannot as the global south we need to as Pan-Africanist people, we need to first consolidate ourselves, but as the global South, we need to do that. And Peter Tos was right. It's only the day the dollar die that the world will be better. There's no other way. <laughs> you, you can fight, you can, it's like spitting against our Southeaster. You know, this time of the year, we have the Southeaster wind. You can't spit against the Southeaster, the spit will come back in your face. That's what you want to fight if you don't want to address the, the fundamental <laughs> structures of the, the inequality and the injustices that will continue if we, if we, uh, you know, if we play this this game. It's a it's it's a brutal mm -hmm. game, and we we can't ask we can't let them dictate that we have decent and civilized conversations about something that's so deeply, deeply uncivilized and barbaric. Mm -hmm. And just very briefly, um, uh, Calvin. So if if we then zoom in concretely into the, the the castle how can the castle sort of play a role in this 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 history or this memory culture 
first of all, that every South African, 60 million of us, is somehow connected through legislation, through legacies, through through land dispossession, through through uh, out migration. Even people in, in Namibia, the Rewood Busters, where people were driven out of the Cape Colony into the Northern Cape, into the Namibia. Uh, so, so for me, it's first of all for every South African to be linked to this, what I call the gravestone of armed colonial conquest. Like we go to our, 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 our grandparents or whatever and reflect there on a difficult past, every South African needs to reflect here. And and even what's happening, even post-apartheid South Africa, they, 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 they try to divide memory communities. So these ones, if they have a certain color, will only go to Robben Island or they will go to the apartheid museum, the others will go there. So, so, so I think as, a, as, as memory communities, we must all join together and say that the struggle for humanity, the struggle for decency, for development, for inclusivity is only, is only attainable through mass mobilization and through mass uh, um, uh, con uh, you know, solidarity. So we can't separate what's happening in Haiti, Hawaii, or in Niger. We can't separate it from what's happening in the Cape. With no, we lost him again. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a perfect ending of his uh, statement. <laughs> In a way, solidarity and mass mobilization. Indeed. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're ending um, the, um, a particular time. Um, so, um, I mean, this sounds like we could go on, right? Uh, but <laughs> we don't want to capitalize on your, your on your time uh, too much. But um, so, um, right, Mitchell? I think we should. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think we can, and we should go on for hours and hours and hours. But yeah, let's do that in uh, yeah in in different phases. So may I just answer the question that was please. given to Hoban, yeah. I, because yeah. I think. You know, one thing I will say that the, there's an issue that we have when we think in global black thought where we love to think about black South Africa, but we don't necessarily think with black South Africa. Um, and whether it's racial capitalism, very few people would know that that came out of discourses from the black consciousness movement, for example. Um, and one of the things, um, you know, engaging very seriously, and I think part of the issue being that you've had a long uh you had a lot of discourses of white South Africans in particular coming to the Netherlands and never you never get that perspective from, from black South Africans. And one of the issues with this consistent uh, export of white South African ideas is around the lack of, a, of, of the critical discourse around the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which is heavily contested um, within South Africa, just like the legacies of people like Desmond Tutu, people like Nelson Mandela. Those kinds of paths of so-called racial reconciliation are incredibly uh, contested um, in this country um, because, I mean, a part of it, if you want to read a little bit more in detail, I do um, include a critique of the Truth and Reconciliation mod uh, uh, a Commission as a model for, for uh, a repair in my Nelson Mandela lecture, so you can just check that out. Um, also, um, coming up, I have now actually gone through and done an Ubuntu informed critique of Ubuntu at the TRC, um, which is coming out in the in the magazine called The Funambulist, which is really a great uh, a global South majority uh, uh, platform. But the essence really is the idea that this idea of uh, uh, this African philosophy of personhood, a person is a person to other people, Ubuntu, Ubuntu, Ngabanye Bantu, in Ubuntu has been appropriated in the same way that Diana is speaking about the fact that the Afrikaners um, and the language that the indigenous and the enslaved people um, have created as a radical form for themselves is then appropriated um, um, to become. It's so interesting. And when she speaks, um, then, then it freezes. Yeah, go, go on. Uh, the last bit. The, the last, last um, two sentences. The last two sentences specifically is just to say that Ubuntu 
as it is practiced by black people would have ensured or would have demanded a lot more. It would have demanded a material recognition. It would have ensured that the TRC did not happen in the way that it did. And this is why that form of Ubuntu could never happen within the structures of this world because it can only be understood as one that benefits our former colonizers and not actually ensures repair with, with the communities. Uh, uh, yeah, right. I think it's very clear with financial yeah, energy. And um, actually the links to her Mandela lecture can be found uh, yeah, in the chat yeah. and also on our website. So the page where you registered for this online event, we have a link to the, the video and the text. Right. So, I, I'll just give a final reference, which is in The Guardian. It's called, Can White South Africa Live Up, Live Up to Ubuntu? The African mm. philosophy that Desmond Tutu uh, mm. uh, uh, globalized. And just to think very seriously about what happens when we take African thought and African metaphysical systems seriously, as opposed to the whitewashed ways in which they're presented back to us. And I think finally for me, it is really to say, before we can even get to our former colonizers, it's about us taking ourselves seriously and daring to imagine beyond what has been presented <clears throat> to us will be a beginning to really think about uh, reparations beyond just a financial check given to our communities. Mm. Brilliant. Because that two hundred right. million is a joke, Andy. Let, let that be clear. <laughs> All right. Thank you for me. For me, it's very important that we work out a way in we in which we mm -hmm. can self-sustain. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we have to learn a way of life in which we self-sustain. Because only if our dependence on that capitalism, that what kind of capitalism, if only if we yeah. can get rid of that, then we can be on equal yeah. ground. And I want to say hello to Polly Levens. I see she just, uh, she just posted something. We met in the Netherlands some years ago. She's from uh, Suriname. Hello, Polly. <laughs> Great to see you yeah. here. And there was also a remark about the Slavery Museum that's coming up, um, I have to say, in the Netherlands. And I have to say, yeah, we have to push for actually the South African story to be included there because that's not a given. Um, we want to thank um, our distinguished guests from South Africa. Yeah. Um, it's been a huge honor to share the digital space with you, Diana Ferris. Um, um, you know, I've heard so much about you. I've, um, um, the, the poem that you've given to the world has been such a blessing in many, many ways, spiritually, but also politically. Uh, so thank you so much for that. Um, Panache, it's been amazing to hear you speak and uh, all the wisdom that you've shared with us and with everyone, everyone in the digital room. Um, everyone is um, mentioning also your name and thanking you for uh, all your, all your, um, all your mini lectures. Um, and um, last but certainly not least, um, Calvin from the oldest <laughs> building in Cape Town, still standing. Um, keeping us um, uh, sharp in the material remnants of uh, colonial history and violence. Um, we this, this this conversation is not over, obviously, but it's uh, no, no, no. over for now. Um, and Mitchell. No, yeah, as you said, this uh, is a conversation that uh, should be ongoing. Uh, we see it as part of the process. And when Lajeta made this quote unquote apology speech, he said, I was at a point, him point but a comma, reporting a, uh, not a period, but a comma that was actually uh, stolen from a Dutch Caribbean artist named Sarana Angelista, who mentioned that in, uh, in the interview. And that's also uh, the way that we look at this process. Eh? Eh? Repair, reparations, and a very important aspect of it is this conversation that we learned about each other's history and think together about alternatives for the future. Um, so one of our ambitions is to, um, yeah, move or, or, or create, open a 
adapted form of this exhibition, both in Amsterdam and the Cape, and maybe other places in Southern Africa as well. So we can continue the conversation, continue to learn, uh, continue to think together, and hopefully also mobilize together, be in solidarity with each other. And it was mentioned several times, and I do think we have to underline it as well when we look at what is happening in the world right now, specifically in Palestine, that yeah, we're literally seeing a, a genocide happening, a 21st century form of apartheid, where people are being murdered, supported by Western states, including the Dutch, uh, including uh, the demissionary prime minister, Luther. Uh, you know, it shows that it is vital, it's a matter of life and death to continue to fight against all these kinds of structures of uh, colonialism and, and, and inequality. So our solidarity goes out to the Palestinian people fighting for their liberation as well. Um, and yeah, the conversation will continue. Uh, we will stay in touch, all of us will stay in touch. Uh, the exhibition Cape Ex Utrecht is open till November 4th, and Nancy will actually give uh, a few tours this Saturday, next Saturday. Some of the artists who are participating will be there as well to share their uh, work and thoughts as well. So, yeah, with that being said, I, I want to thank everybody again. Uh, also, everybody who joined us during the live stream in the chat. Uh, I learned a lot. I think thought it was a very inspiring uh, online gathering. And uh, yeah, the conversation will continue. Thank you. Wishing you well and uh, see you next time. Indeed. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks thank everyone you. for listening. Yeah. Bye. Bye bye, everybody. And thank you. Bye. 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 bye.